Hey, good morning. Yes, it is. It's Friday, April 12th. So I thought today what we could discuss is, like with yesterday's video with Claude and New Old School, how sometimes they can clash and how sometimes when we come to a deadhead New School, Old School will get you through to the finish line. So hang tight. All right. So welcome back. If you didn't already know, my name is Eric, and we do the weekday show Monday through Friday. Of course, this is the end of the week. And we also do a couple of videos over the weekend and we do some repair videos during the day. But the big thing with this channel is you're gonna at least see one daily upload, you know, talking about something. So today we're gonna to talk about new school versus old school. And this even, it this crosses what I call party lines, all right? It's not just restricted to small engine repair or automobile repair or, you know, relationships. I mean, that's what I mean. It's sometimes old school will get you across the finish line. You may have gotten close with new school, but I can pretty much guarantee that a lot of these Predator engines and Hondas have been tossed and junked because when they did the feeler gauge, they couldn't get the compression to come up. And that's what I ran into on both of them is I was trying to do it in new school and I was looking up the valve clearance online and on the first Predator, the 79cc, it read, you know, 0 0.080 on the intake side. And then it's on the exhaust side to go 0 0.10. And by doing that, I couldn't get it to come above 52, 54 PSI. New school... I'd have tossed it. You know, we all like to talk about if you don't have compression, you don't have anything. And sometimes you can do a quick compression check and it reads low. But that isn't the primary reason that you just give up on it. If it's got overhead valves, there is a chance you can adjust that engine to what you need it to be. Case in point was the two Predators, right? And, you know, I didn't know it, but Claude did. The Hondas are the same way, but if you look at the Predator, the Predator is basically a Honda clone. Yeah, they've just cloned the Hondas. And I think that falls in line with some of the uh, chainsaws that are out there that have parts interchanged with steels and with Husqvarna's is the Chinese are not creating something new. No. What they've done is they've re-engineered it or they've taken the blueprints that the U.S. companies have given them on how, to, how they want their saw or their engine to be and they've done it and come out with a new label on it. Predators are Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight has their own tools and their own engines manufactured just for them with their brands and even though there might be three different brands and tractor supply of let's say battery operated tools all three are manufactured just for harbor freight good or bad or ugly and the more people that shop at harbor freight based on price you know the you're basically getting a Honda engine, right? And 
just called a predator and it comes with a warranty if you want to have the warranty through Harbor Freight. But there's other areas that not just the valves that old school can listen, you know, and can find things and identify things because it's that aha moment of I've seen this before I've chased my tail on it and this is the workaround that I found and once he mentioned that Honda engine it all come back that I remember him spending quite a bit of time on that Honda and I couldn't build a customer that much but he didn't want to give up because he had done it and then he got it up so high and then it would drop off on him and so he's coming from a place of experience of he's done it before and if you watch any of my videos I always talk about you need the time to gain the experience and then your experiences good or bad are accumulated and hopefully the bad experiences you've turned into good and even if you you can't just toss the bad experiences you have to keep them there as a waypoint to wisdom that okay this did not work and for me with this predator engine I am going to stick it back here now and say now we've had this issue with the valves and through my normal you know diagnostic i would have tossed the engine not tossed it but i would have just charged a 40 dollar you know fee to take a look at it diagnostic fee and set it aside as a no fix because I didn't have the experience. I couldn't remember about the Honda until he brought it up. And I hadn't done a lot with the Predators. I've done quite a bit with the Colders, Tecumseys, Briggs, you know, all the major lines. But not the Predator yet. And for you guys that haven't encountered the Predator, you will. Because they're the cheapest engine. I'm not saying cheapest by quality. I'm just saying cheapest by price out there. And that, you know, we've used the Predator engine through Harbor Freight on some of our builds of where a customer had a whisperer that the engine went. And we re-engineered one from Harbor Freight so that he could continue to use his whisperer. But I think, and I want you guys to chime in, Amos, Travis, Jason, Ed, Barry, Peter. You know, you guys have all got experience. MPH, work and play. What are some of the things that you've encountered that, where if you did your strictly new school, would you have given up versus having, because I know you guys are old school. And a lot of you guys, like Travis and Jason, are a combination of new school, old school. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you guys are by the book. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're looking in the book every time. No, there's a certain procedure. There's a certain clearance you should have, a certain way to go about it. And you also have the wisdom to do workarounds whenever needed, right? I mean, like Jason, with you, carburetors, you hardly ever rebuild them. You take them apart, clean them up, put them back together, and you might replace a gasket here or there, put them in the ultrasonic cleaning for a little bit 
slap them back together and it's good as new. Where a lot of shops are teaching their mechanics, the new mechanics, to just replace them. Because a lot of shops, like the, the local steel, steel dealership that I know of, they don't do carburetor rebuilds anymore. And there's two reasons. They charge a hundred and some dollars an hour, all right, to work on your stuff. And probably a steel carburetor for, let's say, the MS250 OEM might run around 50, 60 bucks. So dealer cost is probably closer to 35 to 40. By the time their mechanic takes that carburetor off, takes it apart, cleans it, new kit, puts it back on, if it works, then that's great. But if they didn't, if it didn't work correctly, or something there's an issue, then they've already wasted an hour, which is a hundred and some dollars an hour. So what they've done is they've just basically told them to part replace, just put a new carburetor on it, and they've got bins right full of these carburetors for the chainsaws and trimmers, a bin right full. And they sell that for scrap aluminum every year for Christmas money. Because the owner figures for the hour that it's going to take to tear that saw down, get it back together, and back to the customer, it's cheaper just to throw a new carburetor on it and have no issues. Just fine-tune the, the new one, but most of them are already preset. Old school, you could have that carburetor tore down pretty quick. And like you said, Jason, throw it in the ultrasonic and go do something else on somebody else's machine while that's you know, being clean so that you're not tying up all the time just on that carburetor. I can see both ways. Especially if you want to stick with the OEMs. Now, when you talk an hourly rate that you're paying, you're charging the customer, you know, well, from China at $11, plus you got all these extra parts. Ooh, now you're getting hard to justify rebuilding because I know most Walboro or Zama kits, because I sell a lot of, you know, repair kits, rebuild kits for the, the carburetors, can run you anywhere from 12 to 30 some dollars, depending on the carburetor. And then there's no guarantee, right? Because I've had people that have been in, you know, they know just enough to get themselves into trouble, and then they bring it to us, right? They've had it apart. They've probably lost a part. And unless you pick up on that part that they lost, or maybe they tried drilling out the air hole and they drilled too big of a hole, on the older carburetors that go on the four-stroke engines, you could chase your tail on that. So if somebody, if, if I see where somebody has been into it and did them like some things to the carburetor, I don't waste my time. I just go ahead and order another one. Because I don't need to spend all my time trying to figure out what they did. Because they won't come good for it. You know, they won't say they did anything. It just, it won't run. The best are when they bring it into you in a box, right? And say, well, can you fix this? We can fix anything. How thick is your pocketbook? Is the answer. But old school is has still got a place when it comes to repairs, small engine repairs. And I'm learning every day something new from Claude. I, I apologize right now because he swears like a drunken sailor. 
you know, tried to curb his language, but he just gets to rattling. But he's a good mechanic. He knows what he's talking about. And he draws a lot from experience. And his history was car mechanic for years. And then he went into the forestry division and he did work on skitters, fellow bunchers, tractor trailers, you know. And then from there he went to, still in the forestry, but into tree cutting crews for the power lines. Nielsen, you know, is one. There's a number of them out there, but he worked for Tamarack. And he was their mechanic that did the trucks, the buckets, the hydraulics, all of that. So he brings a lot of skill from a lot of different areas. But we hardly ever see at the shop a skater, fellow buncher, bucket truck, or that. We're looking at small engines. And I say, you know, once a mechanic, always a mechanic. If you are a good auto mechanic, you can be a good small engine repair mechanic because you've already got the basics down of how you approach something. You do. Is it a little bit different and can throw you a curveball? Sure. But it would be just like you taking me not to new school mechanics now. I mean, it's a whole different realm. But to work on the 78 Chevy Camaro that I used to have, that was old school, you know, 350. Those mechanics had a certain way of going about it. The Today's mechanic, you have to plug it in. There's no way. And when you plug it in, it's not telling you what's wrong with it it just tells you where to go to check and you need to know how to check you know whether it's ohms or volts or what have you and you need to know what the specs are the clearances are before you dive in right if not you're just chasing your tail but as yesterday's video with the predator I was chasing my tail because I was trying to stay new school of what the schools are teaching us you know on adjusting valves and so forth but sometimes you have to think outside the box sometimes you have to look to see if anybody has found a better way YouTube has really been good about that the only thing I, I don't like about YouTube is a lot of times they don't show you the time it took to get everything tore down the first time especially on tractors you know when it's replacing a rear inner seal on a tire tire seal they don't show you all the all the things that they had to do to get it to the point of where they just showed it taking a couple bolts and sliding the axle out and it's not that easy folks claude and i working together with air impact battery impact wrenches just to get that rear axle to come off took us a couple hours and knowing where to put your jacks your jack stands how to balance it and then even taking off a loaded tire. How do you manhandle that tire? Because I'll tell you, she is heavy when they're loaded. So a lot of videos skip over the hard work and they get right to the heart of the matter. And that is how to replace the seal. They just all of a sudden, it just takes a minute and they're sliding the rear axle off setting it on a table, popping the seal out, popping a new seal in, and abracadabra somehow it all goes back together so nice and smooth. That only happens in fairy tales, folks. You don't see the guy 
swearing at the tractor and slamming his fingers and using a rubber mallet to try to get things to loosen up. Because he's either edited that out or decided that he didn't want to look like a fool taking that long to do it. I don't know. Or he didn't think it was that important. I think it is. I think you need to see from beginning to the end. Good or bad. You, I'm not perfect, so I'm not afraid to put myself out there on a video and say this is how I approach things. Because I know I don't know everything. And I know most people aren't expecting me to know everything. I'm just sharing my knowledge and my channel. I am Claude to better equip you guys out there in the field. And of course, with many of you, you're also partaking and giving great advice on different ways or how to do something better. And that all comes from time, experience, wisdom. For you guys that are just getting into the small engine repair, doing the nights and weekends, or do-it-yourselfers, the biggest thing I can tell you is cut yourself some slack. Really. If you watch the bulk of the videos out there on how to fix something, you're not learning a lot. I mean, they go so fast. You can't just stop and, and catch up and then stop at the video and catch up, you know, while you're working on something. I'm trying to do the videos so that you can st stop it, get up to that point, and then watch so much more of the video and do that. Whether it be like how to remove the side panel and then how to remove the valve cover gasket. And then what to expect when you get in there. Now, with your Briggs, Kohler, Tecumseh, Fielder gauges work perfect. I can I tell you that from experience. They work perfect. And they you can find all the different clearances. Briggs has got more than one clearance on one engine. I mean, there's, they carry so many different engines. There, there's a chart out there, and I can post it. If anybody wants it, it's free to the taking. It's a PDF file of the different clearances on their engines, the valve clearances, and the other specs, right, from torque specs and so forth. So let me know if this, if this style video is something you're looking for or do you just like the entertainment value of just speeding it up and overlooking the, the obvious of how did you get to this far? <laughs> So on that note, you guys have a great Friday uh, and a good weekend coming up. Supposed to, the temperatures are getting warmer. Up here, it's supposed to drop back down. We've had, you know, nice 70s again, only to get spoiled. And now we're going to go back down to the 30s at night over the weekend. So, But we're over the hump. We're, we're headed in the right direction. So you guys have a great weekend.